You guys, I am obsessed. Suntan, sunscreen, strawberry, ice cream, midsummer. I would like my emotions back, please. to a brand new vlog. As is always the case with my channel, I come to you unfiltered and all of my meanest, which means that your girl looks like this. I did not start out the day looking like this, braless and dishevelled. I started out with purely good intentions of filming, but instead I quickly realised that today was not going to be a good chronic illness day, and so we decamped from my library down onto the couch. And then we went from the couch into a book bath where I finished Lisa Jewel. I've <laughs> I finished The Night She Disappeared by Lisa Jewell. So by now you guys will have seen my video where I said that I am trying really really hard to avoid a slump. After everything that's happened in the last six weeks reading was really difficult and then I was like okay I can feel I can feel a slump coming. I will just let my brain pick the first really really good impulse that I have. I mean sometimes that leads to pick and mix but in this case it led to this book because Lisa Jewell is almost always a win for me. And the whole idea was that I was gonna read the Lisa Joe book to stop me from entering a slump. But instead, what I think has happened is that the Lisa Joe book is in danger of still putting me in a slump. So freaking good, it was just, it, it was very, very good. And as a result, I, uh, hmm, I'm struggling to think that anything is gonna be that good that I pick up. You know when you've read a really amazing book and you're like, whatever I pick up next is just gonna be shit by comparison. So yeah, I did I did a video where I did a try a chapter tag of all of the books that my lovely friend Amy influenced me to pick up when she was visiting. And I picked three of them. First of those books is Duck Feet by Ellie Percy. This one is set in the mid noughties and it follows Kirsty Campbell and a group of her friends as they leave primary school at like age 12 and they go to high school where they'll be until like age 16 or 17. I thought that the first chapter of this was so incredibly relatable to my experience. I've never read anything where I've really heard my accent in it and like the front cover is this very stereotypically Scottish council house that I so recognise from my childhood and I've decided that I'm going to pick this one up first only really because it was the first one to go on my yes pile. The next one was A Lesson in Vengeance by Victoria Lee. This one is dark academia but rather than leaning on like dark academia in the classics department, we are in the literary department, which I really loved in the first like chapter of this. I don't think I mentioned that in my try a chapter tag, but this one, instead of it being like Greek myth that we're talking about and we're learning Latin and stuff, we are specifically talking about the literature canon and specifically it really mentioned predominantly women writers, which I really love. And it makes sense because it also has one foot in like horror, or supernatural I guess because this school also contains a history of witchcraft. And then finally there is She and I by, I don't have it here but I think it's Hannah King. You'll be seeing it on the screen right now so if I'm, if I'm wrong you know. This one is a thriller about two I think teenage girls in Ireland who wake up one morning after a party covered in blood with one of the girls boyfriends dead beside them. They have apparently shared everything their entire life, like clothes, secrets, each other's houses, and so they decide that they're going to share the story of how this happened together. Now Harry and I have just had our dinner, Harry is cleaning up downstairs and feeding the dogs and then we're both gonna cosily get into bed. I am gonna start duck feet and we will see how it goes. And we're also on the countdown. We have six days to go, I think, before our lovely Victoria from What Victoria Read comes and spends several days with us. But don't worry, that trip will either make it into the end of this vlog or get an entire vlog all to itself. Again, you'll know better than me. So yeah, let's get comfy and let's get reading. Esme, Esme, 
<laughs> Are you going to be reading with us this evening? Yes. It's oh, like you like that one. It's yeah. better than your brother who eats the corners off them. You get nothing to yourself in this house. Good morning. So here we are in yesterday's outfit with yesterday's recreated hair. And we're going to once again take a crack at filming. But I wanted to just really quickly pop on here the morning after the night before and tell you about Duck Feet because, oh, you guys, I am obsessed. I don't know if this book speaks to me so much because it sounds so much like my youth. It's written in the way that people spoke in my area in my high school. There are whole conversations between our main character and her parents where the exact lines, these really common parental Scottish phrases that my parents would say to me are being like echoed back in the pages and oh, it's so strange because it's like looking past the words and seeing a deeper intention. I don't think I've ever read a literary fiction Scottish book that has given me the same feels as this. Normally the sort of big hits of Scottish literature that come out every year are like Scottish crime which I really really don't like or they're really quite deeply dark depressing novels of poverty usually in inner city Glasgow and while that is absolutely a part of the Scottish experience there is also other parts of the Scottish experience and there are other ways to live in mild poverty as I did as a child than the inner city Glasgow narrative and so it's really nice to see something which looks outside of that. The book's written in almost vignettes I would say so each chapter is kind of its own little contained story that the character is telling you they're very short they're maybe like six or eight pages and the first one was about swimming lessons, the second one was about a French class. But each of these little stories are like individual cogs that add to the whole sum total of the story and give you this really, really rich picture of the main character. It's just, it's so good. It is so good. There's a bit in the back of my brain that still wants like Lisa Jill and thrillers, but we go in with it. What you doing? <laughs> So I am over halfway through Duck Feet now and it is completely compulsive. I cannot tell you the last literary fiction or contemporary book that I picked up and bombed through this fast. I know that a lot of people say that contemporary fiction is one of those things that they pick up when they need a quick read but for me it usually slows me down. I usually have a lot less like impetus to go and pick it up whereas fantasy and things that have like really compelling plots or a lot hanging in the balance are much easier for me to pick up and push myself through because I want to know what the next thing is that's going to happen. I can't remember the last time that happened in a contemporary fiction book but it has with Duck Feet. It's just perfect. It's the perfect blend of everything. It's my school experience, it's my teenage experience, it's the way that we spoke, it's the ignorance that we had. It's the kind of weird insular prejudice that small town Scotland can have while also having this like 
huge amount of heart. I've only seen a couple of criticisms about this book in any of the reviews that I have looked at and mostly they are focused on the way that the book is structured. So as I think I've said before every little chapter starts off with kind of a new topic and I think some people have been seeing this as like interconnected short stories but for me it's just more like a new page in a diary. In fact I think that is putting my finger directly on what I love about this. It's kind of like reading Kirstie's diary and there's something really compulsive about about watching the way that a 12 year old Kirsty has friendships with people which over time evolve into her realising things about humanity. I know that sounds kind of like a big statement but in these little microcosm friendships she's learning about people who are there to support you and people who are only there to take your energy from you and she's learning about how that applies to like people in her parents life and her wider circle of family and I'm just so invested in her I just want the best for her and oh some of the struggles that she gets in and some of the way that she expresses how she feels when she's sad is exactly the way that I would have as a teenager in a very like guarded very sarcastic way. There's a kind of attitude in Scotland particularly in the small mining villages where I am from and where Kirsty is also from where it's like you toughen your child up in your house. There's not a huge amount of intimacy, there's not a huge amount of I love you's or well done's, it's all kind of combative, it's very adversarial, it's very bantery and it's really seen as trying to make your child fit for the outside world and that does not work for every teenager it certainly did not work for me when I was a kid it made me funny and quick-witted but it did not make me capable of managing to navigate up friendships and the ups and downs of relationships and being there for each other and being empathetic and you can see that Kirsty is struggling in that, that this is the upbringing that she's had and yet she's facing situations in her life which don't fit with this kind of like back and forth bantery adversarial thing that her parents have taught her and oh, I just want to hug her every time she's in a difficult situation, every time she's hurt, I just want to hug her because she doesn't know how to express that in a soft way. So yes, I think it's fair to say that I am enjoying duck feet. Now, I have to go and resituate these plants so that they're safe and so that I can carry on actually doing cleaning because actually all I seem to have succeeded on doing is making a larger mess, not a smaller one. <laughs>
back please all of the ones i have poured into this book i have given to this book which this book has sucked into a black hole and is holding it ransom and refuses to give back i didn't expect to be ending this vlog on my thoughts of this book i expected to be ending this vlog after all three books for my try a chapter tag but instead this is going to be a series of vlogs because it turns out that i have so much footage when does that ever happen when does that ever happen that I have too much footage for a vlog and not, not enough? So let's talk non-spoilery thoughts. First of all, the amount of myself that I saw in this book was truly terrifying. I felt myself getting like re-traumatized and healed by them. Um, I did a little bit of research on the author because this book has also got a crap ton of queer representation, of neurodiverse representation, of socioeconomic representation. It has so much in, like, I was going to say in a few short pages. It felt like it flew by. It was 400 pages long. And it turns out that Ellie Percy is actually a trans and non-binary person, which is amazing because I immediately felt that vibe. I immediately felt that vibe by, like, sort of chapter six or seven. I was like... This person gets it. This person gets the queer experience of growing up in working class Scotland. And also that is yet another kick up the arse for not gendering an author before we know for sure how they identify. Things that stick out to me now 
in sitting and talking about it is that so many books about the teenage experience have such absent parents and Kirsty's parents were so present, trying so hard under such difficult circumstances and with not the best experiences themselves of being parented and so therefore they were trying to break the chain of trauma the only way that they knew how. Does that mean that they didn't traumatise their kids? No, but does it mean that they were doing their best? Yeah. It's also really interesting to me that we we go into Duck Feet in first year with a huge cast of characters who Kirstie is just getting to know all of the people in her year level and they all have such different backgrounds and such different challenges and when I say challenges I mean challenges because this does gritty Scotland in a way that I'm finally proud to say this is gritty Scotland. I read so much stuff about Scotland which portrays the working class experience as this joyless void of a place where everybody's destined for prison or substance abuse or something and it's the lucky few who get out and make something of themselves. And I also notice a narrative about Scotland in particular where there is a sort of emphasis that if you stay in Scotland, if you stay in the small town that you were brought up in, that you have somehow failed by not moving away and having an experience of living somewhere else that you are somehow less than and this book dispels that in so many ways. So many of the characters choose very different paths and it gives you a kind of broad range of what those choices could lead to and I, I loved that so much. The only thing that I will say about this book is that as with a lot of truly spectacular literary fiction that I have read, it goes off a bit of a deep end. The last sort of maybe like seven chapters of this introduce a plot point that there just wasn't room for. This book realistically needed another 200 pages to play out the emotional implications of what happens in that last seven chapters and it would just never have been published like that. It would never have been published like that. So I completely see why L.A. Percy had to do what they did. Why we got the that experience of the last seven chapters that leads Kirsty to the final destination where we, we leave her. But I also didn't like it. I didn't like the choices that the author made. This does still fall into the trap of a book about working class Scotland having to be in some way tragic. It could have just been a joyful book about some kids who made some choices and gave a true representation of what it was like to grow up here. And while I understand that there was a need to show the consequences of some of the more senseless and pointless choices that some people have chosen, I also think that it was a little bit of a cop out. I am mad at the last maybe seven chapters and I'm going to pretend that they didn't happen. Uh, that's what my coping strategy is going to be for this one. I'm just going to pretend that they didn't happen. I've still given it five stars but I feel like it's a personal choice as to whether you maybe knock a star off for that ending. So I think that this one was definitely a win. I need to thank Amy again at the end of this vlog for uh, forcing this into my hands when we were in toppings. You win him? No. Somebody's cheating. I don't think that's accurate, you know, because I think I've got just as many dominoes as you do. Ah, but you keep putting the round ones down, so I can't win. <laughs> is, that uh -huh. is that upsetting? But I've just seen one I can put doing unless you scupper me. <sighs> that is the champion. Oh, that is the champion. Oh, um... Not that you're competitive or anything, right? I am the champion, Mavericky. So not that you like to win or anything, no? Well, I usually get beat. It's a novelty when I win. Sure. Sure, Janet. Okay, we'll go with that. <laughs>